Seattle, home of the Sky Needle and, of course, the key arena, which we are getting ever closer to having players emerge. It is our third day here of the groups for the International Seven, and I am your host, Machine. It's my great pleasure to introduce not myself, but also our panelists who are going to be hopefully setting the scene as we work out who will be eliminated. That's right, two teams will be eliminated before they even get to the key arena and will be probably locked in their hotel rooms thinking about their decisions they've made. Some teams are already looking pretty bad, some looking fantastic. And to hopefully explain it, I have Pycat, who is absolutely terrified that he's going to go ahead and uh, flash us his nipple throughout this entire introduction <laughs> segment. <laughs> What's happened uh, to this shirt? My shirt's, it's a little bit, you know, maybe, maybe I've gotten a bit of, you know. Oh, is that what's happened? Too many beers, maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Or, or you're just really excited for yeah. the Dota. That could be it. Yeah. Um, now, alongside him, of course, we have Blitz as well. Taking a break from his coaching duties and flying out last minute due to a variety of uh, unfortunate circumstances, but we do get to have you here, Will. And it's actually it's great to hear your insight, both in the casting and on the couch. You you you're glad to be making another TI? Yeah, but I like how you say a break, as if it was my choice that I was making. Yeah. <laughs> hey, that sounds nice. I like it. You're it's voluntary. Taking a, you're taking a coaching holiday. Yeah, away from one planet odd to another. And this is pretty odd to have to go ahead and work with me. Uh, Quinn, <laughs> we've, uh, we've bonded over the last three days, and I think you're starting to really um, get into the whole TI7 hype train. You know, like day three is when like, these games are really going to start mattering. Yeah, they, you know, all the games matter, but whenever you know, it starts getting day three, day four, you can see the games, like you know, sure. how they matter. You see these, some of these hard matchups that the teams haven't played, you know, yeah. like LFY. It's 10 and 0. They are you know, looking really good, but they haven't played some of the stronger teams. They haven't played yeah. newbie. They haven't played OG. And you see them play these teams, and you can see start to see like their real strength, or you know. Yeah. And what is the word on the street? You know, who who, who are teams talking about saying that they are really good? I think you were talking about was it newbie that a lot of people like, heads are being turned by? Uh, yeah, I think newbie is yeah. a team that's not being talked about much, but I think is very strong right now. Uh, and I think you know just all the the standard teams that people are you know looking out for. Uh, but I think. Newbie has has looked just as strong as I think the top six of you know OG, yeah. EG, VP, the LGDs. Fantastic. Well, we'll talk more about that. But first, uh, in terms of talking, you guys can get in contact with us and also just get involved with each other uh, to kick off our day. Of course, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are watching from. Do be sure to hit us up over on Twitter. It's at Dota2 with the hashtag TI7. Uh, outside of that, on the Facebooks, you can use slash Dota2. And if you're on Instagram as well, pouting with some foundation dota 2 ti is where you can go ahead and find us as well if you're watching as well there's two platforms we're currently going to be uh waving our faces on it's going to be not only twitch but also over on youtube as well just dota 2 on youtube and just add ti to the end of it for twitch and that is how you guys are going to be joining us as we continue this expedition into competitive dota and i'm so glad we have you guys to hang out with us now you've touched on the standings but pike i want you to hear your kind of thoughts about that like, like day two we can't get too hung up on the 10 and zeros, no. the zero and fives, well, the one and five, whatever it is. Yeah, no, um, like Quinn said, uh, Newbie is looking quite strong. The, like one of the games that they lost um, was when they had this random alchemist. Yeah, and can, you can, can we elaborate on that? There's probably something, what, random alchemist TI? Nah, nah. Yeah, yeah, I mean, what the fuck? I, like, <laughs> could you imagine you, you, you go to TI and then you like, either you don't go first place or you don't get into upper bracket because you random the hero. How do you feel about that? That's some pretty depressing territory. That would be Dude. seriously depressing. You planned like the entire year, you made it in, you're up a game against OG, and then all of a sudden that happens. So can you give us a little bit of insight of how that happens, like from a communication standpoint, right? Oh, probably just, they were probably thinking about it the last second. Yeah. Nobody had any concrete ideas. Whoever was drafting was probably like, okay, it's this or this, and I mean, it happens, especially in scrims. Yeah. You know, you're just talking. Yeah, because you need, like, it could be, like, you're talking about a couple of different options, right? Sure. And, like, you have some options, and then you're like, oh, shit, we have 20 seconds left. And then, whoa, what the fuck? Uh, what do we do? And then you're like, you're going to pick a hero, and then it's, nope. You random alchemist. It happens, it happens in scrims pretty frequently where, you know, you're thinking about a hero or something, and then, you know, you just, it, it just randoms, and you're like, you know, just go remake, and you pick the hero that... Yeah. You, you want it or whatever, but you don't get to do that in no, matches. No. You're stuck with an alchemist. So do you, is it, does it cool down to not only, you know, taking a while to make a decision, did you, is there any credit given to the other team for making your decision difficult? 
you know, like the discussions, yeah, the fact that you're even having a discussion is because, you know, there is options available to you and you're not quite sure where to take it. Yeah, it could definitely be. I mean, if the if the enemy bans out something that you were planning, sure. or if multiple, you know, multiple of your options are, you know, getting like removed, a check then, chess. yeah, exactly. You're like, hmm, well, what do we do now? You know, that was our, you know, maybe they ban two heroes that you were going to take and you're like, well, one was our hero and the other one was our backup. And then you're right. like, well, all right, now we've got to sink a bit. And, and just, hopefully not too long. And we, we, we will bring up the standings, and I want to come back and pull on this thread just after we do, because I think it's very interesting about, you know, who in your guys' minds as players is the most proficient in the draft. And that is, I mean, it's a big part of Dota. We'll come back to it, though. Quickly, I want to summon those standings so you guys can see, and they have been behind us. But just to quickly recap where we're at right now, you can see that 10 and 0 we keep referring to is that of LFY, and just beneath them, you can see Newbie looking very scary as well. The Chinese region have come in swinging so far and i think you know i think my eyes are drawn especially in group b will correct me if i'm wrong but vpog four losses under their belt yeah and they've had quite a difficult group just because nobody really expected lfy to be as good as they are mm. i was talking with some people last night uh some of the pros and tbd and they were just saying lfy is legit lgd maybe false kings you know okay. maybe we crowned them a little bit too soon after day one they looked a little bit shaky but lfy has just been they've looked unstoppable at this point in this group Maybe it's, it's not actually a crown, it's like a Burger King crown that they got there <laughs> with their <laughs> happy meal. Did, did, L, did LGD, did they go 1-3 and three yesterday? Was uh, it? They were, they, were they 6-0 and oh if their first yeah, day? Was that LFI? Yeah, they were, right? Yes, they were. And now they're 7-3. Yeah. And LFI were actually 4-0. Oh, yeah, exactly. And then they went 6-0 and oh in that kind of group Damn. with that kind of competition. And they did not just look good. They starched people. Mm -hmm. That series against VP, who has beaten VP in 15 minutes? You can't claim anything. In the past, you're like, maybe VP's not trying at the summit. They're messing right. around. This is TI. They got beaten 15 straight minutes. No problem. Yeah. And I think, you know, what is the biggest alarm bell in Group B? It is behind you in case you want to kind of refresh your memory. Is it VP having a little bit of a turbulent time? Is Do we look lower down in the standings, Pika? You, you know, were you expecting more from... I know you're, you're a close friend of Saxa. What do you think his coaching was going to get, you know, HR any further? Planet well, Dog? I think it's really hard to... Um, I mean, HR is one of those teams, right? They're they're not expected to do that well. Sure. I figure maybe he could do something, but I do think that the group B it it looks pretty much, you know, the the top of the group is yeah. kind of where you'd expect it to be. I guess the one big surprise is like LFY doing that well. You know, you could throw those teams around a little bit. Maybe like newbie VG, uh, newbie VP, and OG could sure. be somewhere in the top three, and then you'd expect LFY to be a little bit further down. But I I feel like it's mm. it's going pretty much. According to expectations, I guess. Okay, so expectations met on Group B, maybe a couple of bumps on the way. But Quinn, I know you've got your eyes on Group A as well. Now, when we spoke at the very start of like day one, the discussion was like, you didn't quite understand the distribution of the, the invited teams. Uh, only two of them featured in towards Group A, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, what do you make of it now? Now you see the liquids paving the way, the false kings, as, as Blitz has quite eloquently described, LGD. What do you make of it all? Uh, I think the the whole Group A only getting two invited teams comes down to LGD being valued pretty highly okay. um, just as a team. Uh, I think a lot of people thought they were very strong coming in, sort of like we said, maybe False Kings, maybe a little bit better or a little bit worse than people uh, you know thought they were coming into it. I also think Secret was maybe valued pretty highly, um, TNC. They have a lot of these mid-range Dark Horse teams that you aren't really sure how they could perform. And I think Secret has, you know, underperformed a little bit. TNC maybe overperformed, looking pretty good in a lot of their matches. Um, you know, would be six and two if it wasn't for that, you know, the little bit of a throw at the end of the game versus Secret. So I think it sort of comes down to having a couple of, you know, really, really high tier teams, maybe a little bit of an overrated team in LGD, uh, and then some like mid range teams as compared to just a lot of Titans and then maybe some weak teams in Group B. Interesting. And then we'll get to see the Milk Horse do battle once again. If you haven't been with us for the past two days, you have missed quite the roller coaster for some of these teams. That TNC throw, I know we don't have the replay handy, but you can quickly explain. Like six and two would have been a very juicy scoreline to have got to 59 minutes into the game and all hell breaks loose. Yeah, just uh, a couple of maybe wasted buybacks trying to end the game a little bit too fast, over ambitious, yeah. and then suddenly your base is just dead because you have no buybacks on anyone. They would have had. You know, same sort, same uh, loss score as Liquid, which yeah. puts them in a really good position. But the thing is about TNC, though, is like, isn't it? Shouldn't we start expecting them to do pretty well? Like, I mean, looking at last year's TI, they knocked out OG. They've, I feel like, they always kind of show up at these like big events. Yeah. At these bigger events, they've started to show up a lot of them, right? No, they're and, incredibly good. Yeah. So, and if yeah, like like we said, if they had beaten 
if they had won that game, they would have been six and two. That would have been like same as newbie. These guys are, I mean, especially I would say like Raven. That guy, he's a pretty much standout player. And also, I think uh, it seems like Theban one for three seven has helped them a lot. Uh, I think having the the three core players stick together over the course of you know an entire year, it was the same three core players at last TI, and now they're still together. You definitely build like a firm understanding of the game. You sort of share like what heroes you think are good, how you like to play the game, mm. and then you have a captain come in like one four three seven, and it's sort of like it all just pulls it all together. You have someone that can lead as well as having you know core players that are very used to each other's play style. And I mean, how much do you think that, that can that contribute to a victory, understanding one another's play style, do you think, at PyCat? Do you think that is something that really, truly can make be the, you know, the difference between a good and, and a great team? I definitely do think so. I think it's really important for course to, they need to, to not, not just understand each other, but they also need to, like, they need to work together. Because some course, they don't work that well. Sometimes you have course that make too much space, you know? You need, you need that one guy who kind of soaks up the space, and you usually need two or one and a half players who make the space in combination with your support players. So you need a good mixture, you need a good balance between these cores who kind of create space and who take up the space. Because if you have too much, well, then there's, then you have no room. Then everyone's just farming and you're dying. And if you have people who make too much space, well, then you have no one to kind of utilize all that space that you're making and no one to kind of take you further into this game and actually win you the game. There have been some highs and lows, for sure, of, of kind of teams that have more of a friendship element than others. Um, and actually, highs and lows is where I want to take this. You know, it's early in the morning here in Seattle. The, the key arena and the main event hall is starting to really take shape, right? Like, this is... It's I'm starting very, to look good. I'm starting to get very excited for what's going to happen into the main event. You guys at home should, too. But, I mean, just talking kind of, you know, highlights, lowlights, while we have you and while we have time, what's like... For all of you, and I'll let you start thinking, what is your greatest moment in Dota 2 for you? You could have been playing, you could have been watching, you could have been coaching, you know, whatever it is. It, it, does anyone have something that immediately springs to mind? EG Ehome, game one. That cast? Yeah, that was, I was thinking to myself, I was like, Ehome has got this. This game is pretty much unlosable. Yeah. Obviously, a little bit of bias in that cast because EG, sure. watching them do something amazing like that was incredible. And the fact that, they came back from that sort of deficit. I mean, my favorite story is one of the players on that team told me that after they got mega creeped, they actually wanted to call it. They didn't want to see the game through at all. They were just like, the game's done. They actually had yeah, that conversation. They're like, it was one of those things where, because if you invest so heavily into a game emotionally and you lose, oh yeah, you're just, if you looked at Ehome's faces after they lost that game, they weren't in it anymore. They gg They were just like, Are that you, tournament like, run was over. Are you unable to tell us who that was? Uh, I don't know if I should, but. Yeah. They were just done. Oof. Like Ehome, they lost three straight games after looking near invincible. They had yeah. so many good ideas about the game. They did. So that that could probably be a really fantastic example of you know how emotions can affect Dota. We always talk about it being an emotional game. I think Ehome could be one of those great ones we put under the petri dish as an example of just just how destroyed you can get from a, a bad loss. Uh, so were you casting that like it was over? Did you find yourself kind of like? Describe, like, I mean, EG Ehome, to be fair, a lot of people thought that game was over. There was this point where in the game where I was just kind of like, oh man, this was such a great game. Yeah. Like, ah, it got to mega creeps. EG, it was a good run. Like, you yeah. guys did. You start wrapping it up. Hang your heads think. high. Like, there's no, you, there's no shame in that loss. It's yeah. all good. And then it, you, they had two buy, two heroes, no buyback. There's like three support heroes left. There's like Sumail. And I was like, okay, they have no buybacks. Like, all right, yeah. what are we going to do for the next cap? How do we top this? Like, <laughs> and then that happens. It's wow. that's incredible. Yeah. What about you, Quinn? I mean, you kind of you have uh, you've taken it Dota by storm as of late. Now you're sitting on a couch. You've been climbing those uh, that MMR. What, what what do you reckon is your your highlight from your time in Dota? Uh, probably either beating NP in the group stage in this qualifier. It's mm -hmm. like. Whenever you beat a team that you're not expected to beat, and like you know everybody's like really excited, at, you know you're like doing well throughout the game, or yeah. it's like a comeback, a close game, it's like super exciting whenever you win. Like everybody just loses it and stuff. Uh, probably deaths or killing Miracle at the soul <laughs> killing him at the the summit. It's pretty awesome. Nice, yeah. Killing Miracle is always going to be an achievement. Um, Pika, we haven't heard yours. Well, I think uh, when I was coaching, I think it was, I mean, it was definitely beating EG mm. in the. Um, Winner bracket finals, uh, loser bracket finals at TI last year. I think that was, it was really fun. It was like everyone was really, really excited about that match. Everyone was really looking forward to play EG 
and it was kind of I don't know it just felt like for us it, it really felt like a win you know yeah. it felt really good to I bet and uh, that was definitely fun they were also you know the, the returning champions and you know a lot of people expected them to kind of win or maybe you know so that felt really good um, aside from that I also liked the there's this one time at the ESL Frankfurt hmm. when I played X mid and I got ganked by three people and then it was against the IG I think and uh, I just managed to to turn it around and get first blood and a double kill cool. and then yeah, it was really fun and then I stood up and I kind of I pulled out my earphone because I wanted to do this to the crowd because it was really fun sure, you know sure. it's like it's, you know you, you don't get so you're standing up you don't always get those yeah, moments yeah, so plugged into PC yeah and there. then I was like well and then we had to pause the game so you know I got to enjoy <laughs> that moment a little bit longer than I probably should have but yeah, that was definitely fun yeah and that is the kind of experience that players at TI are going to be hunting for, even on a more grandiose scale. Yeah, you know? for sure. Making a play like that, playing your favorite game that you've dedicated, you know, tens of thousands of hours to over the course of your career, and you get to do something special in front of a crowd like that, and for you guys at home like that, it's... I think that's what every everyone that's here is is looking for. Not only the, the trophy, not only the the, mine, the money and the prestige, but like the big play, the big play. I mean, when, when you kind of think about the biggest plays in Dota, they're all, are they are the majority of them at TI? Yes. Yeah. They definitely are. I mean, the six six, six million, million dollar X Sam, yeah. million dollar Dream, Dream Carl. Carl. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> the uh, yeah, he remembers by the way. Um, he does. What else? I mean, like it's not just about place either. It could be also like I think everyone remembers this Sumail Storm Spirit being. Yeah. He was down. That was was that DAC though? Was DAC. That was DAC, yeah. DAC though. That was DAC. Yeah. But still, everyone remembers that too. Um, the the Sumail Storm Spirit being down. What was he? Zero four or zero five? It was a I lot of times. And then he, I mean, he turned it around in like five minutes, got like twice the amount of kills, stuff like that. I think that's what that's what really. Those were the things that you really remember as a yeah. player, kind of those those stand out kind of comeback or some you know you get out of a sticky situation, you get out of some, you do something you weren't supposed to do and you kind of get away with it. Defy the odds. Yeah, that's like very it. fun. Okay, so I mean, those are the kind of plays we're going to be seeing go down, uh, not only in group stage, but also over into main event. Just two days left, and I think, you know, if, if you start reflecting on teams that have to truly change, every, like, change things around now, what's the realistic comebacks we can get from these standings, guys? I want, you know, I want to see a team rise from the ashes, because it is, a team can be eliminated here, and if you look at the, you know, the, the tables as, as they are now, I want to just make sure I double-check this right, yep, still one win under their belt, Fnatic, and one win under their belt, Cloud9 Hellraisers. I mean, one of them um, from either group is going home. I think Cloud9 is the team that I most expect to make that kind of turnaround just because this team is skilled. Yeah. This team has players that have won majors, that have done well in majors. This is a team that has... They high... have a player who has won TI. Exactly. They have all of these guys that stand out to me. And the fact that they're not putting it together, it's just kind of baffling. Why I do you know. think that is... I think I, I had a talk with Fada when, about two days ago, and it was just, we kind of came to the consensus that at TI, you don't need a lot of ideas. You yeah. need a good concept, a few heroes, that's it. You don't need to play a ton of heroes. We were looking at LFY stats, for example, and LFY, they picked their mid-hero the same three heroes over and over again. Right. And you might think to yourself, that's incredibly predictable. Well, look at them, they're 10-0. and 0. Consistency at a tournament like this matters, and I don't think Cloud9 have quite found that consistency yet. They don't really know what direction they want to take their team. They're kind of doing a little bit of everything you can see in their draft and their play. They're not really certain what direction that they want to take. They're just thinking to themselves, ah, does this work? Yeah. And if it doesn't work, I asked him, he's like, I don't know if it's a draft or a play problem anymore because certain teams could make that work and maybe That's we're just you, bad. Right. Yeah. Whenever you like lose that many games, like we talked about in the past, like you start losing confidence in what you think is good or like your ideas about the game. You don't really know what's good anymore and you kind of end up just floundering around until Maybe you win some game and, you know, like right. you find a light bulb that, oh, it was, you know, this hero was really good or worked really well for our style or, you know, everybody just sort of clicks and starts playing like, you know, at their best again. It's it's pretty hard to be in that spot. How would you change that if you were there? Uh, I think everyone just has to sort of rally around a certain play style or a certain idea, like find a player you want to play around, um, you know, get everybody's thoughts on like, what you think the the problem is. And I think you just have to be concise, like have an idea of what you want to do, or what you think is wrong, and just commit to doing that thing or fixing that issue. Yeah. Because everybody can't have their own ideas about what they think is wrong or what is bad or whatever. 
So it's just a question of one, like, do, do you, are you saying they lack leadership? Is that kind of the TLDR of what we're saying here, Blitz? You are, you're, you're, you're following your brow there. Perhaps not leadership then. Uh, I don't know if it's a structure. It's necessary. Yeah, structure is the best way. Okay. For example, at Boston Major, what Bulba introduced to our team on DC was structure. He said, this is how we're going to draft. This is how we're going to play. This is how we should do things. As long as these conditions are met, we're going to be okay. Mm. And it was so helpful to our group. And we kept that kind of mentality up until the end, of course, <laughs> where we're like, we need this kind of structure. We need this kind of draft structure, especially so that even if things go wrong, we know exactly where it went wrong. We missed this. We missed that. It's like PyCat says, he's like, you need, that's how LGD or LFI draft, right? You need these certain conditions to win the game. You need somebody to hit the tower. You need some amount of stuns. So a formula to almost to exactly. put everything into. And right now, I think they lack that. I think because they've lost games that they weren't supposed to lose. I know the OG series was something that looked really one-sided. It's like, do our concepts work? Does our formula work anymore? And yeah. you've got to kind of hunker down and say, it's not a big deal. Let's get through this. It was day one and day two. It happens to everybody. There's still a lot of games to play. Still a lot of games to play. It's not a, definitely not the end of the road for Cloud9. Uh, just while we're on the topic of, of drafts, which, Panka, did you want to add anything to kind of the, the Cloud9 discussion that they could kind of start to return? They've got two days of games. They've got plenty to, left, to, left in the tank. Yeah, well, I think um, something that sometimes happens, um, I've been through it before. I remember at TI4 when I was playing with, uh, I was playing with Fada as well, and we played, um, I played with Mouse Sports then. We, uh, we, we did kind of poorly the first, uh, the first like two days, I think. We, were, we went like one and six or something, and we felt, we felt really bad. And then I think we, I don't know if we went even one and seven. And then at that point, something happened with us because we were like, well, backs against the wall, you know? It's like, if we lose this game, you know, we're, we're, we're done. And then it's like, then you're like, all right, whatever. You just, you just go for it. And then, then people sort of start to relax. Because they're like... That, doesn't, that sounds counterintuitive. It, it is. It, it, it sounds counterintuitive, but it's like, you know, hey, like, there's... What, what can we do, you know? We, we just got to do our best with what we got. Yeah. And then people just... You just roll with it. And sometimes it just works out like that. So almost kind of you thriving under pressure Finally, I think so. when, when it when it really gets to you when it yeah. really gets to you when your back's actually against the wall and you're like then you know you know that you can't think of all these options you just gotta go with like all right guys what do we do we just go with this one thing all right we're done and then everyone's like yeah all right let's do this and the thing is you can't right. really you can't really think you can't overthink it you can't go back and oh we could have done this we could have done this you know it doesn't matter it doesn't help all you gotta do is you just gotta like like uh, Quinn said, it's like you gotta rally around something, you know, mm. anything. And because sometimes playing playing against um, playing like around one idea is much better. It's like if you if you were to punch someone, you know, you punch someone with a finger or you know one two. It doesn't matter if you have five strong fingers if you go like this. Mm -hmm. But if you form a fist, even you know even a fist of weaker fingers is still better than doing this, right? Yeah, goddamn. You need a, you need a beard. So you can stroke it as you deliver the <laughs> beautiful uh, yeah. nuggets of knowledge. Beautiful stuff. Yeah. But indeed, you're right. Like, you, you doesn't matter how, how much you... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you comment on someone like that. I, I like mean, I'm sure there's, there's can... probably some, some kind of martial arts. You can poke eyes, though. Yeah, right. This. That's, that's think... true. That's true. Two players could yeah. do a lot. The expression, That's, that's believe... counterpicking. Yeah. That's right. counterpicking. I like it. Yeah. Um, the expression is stronger than the sum of their parts, I think. But yes. that's exactly what you can be. And mm -hmm. I think that's interesting that, you know, the, today is sink or swim time for Hellraiser's fanatic Cloud9. All of them, you either, you know, go down swinging or it's going to be just a case of watching from the key arena stands because those are your options. Two teams could be eliminated from the 18-team uh, group stage uh, before we even get to that main event. Now, we were talking about drafting, and I think that's always something that, you know, we're not covering it here on the panel, but in terms of just like where, you know, where are your, where's your mind go when we talk about fantastic drafting, when we talk about winning the game in the draft, is there any, is there a, you know, a particular team? Is there something, you know, that springs to mind when I ask about that blitz? Probably the easiest example, of course, is going to be LFI. Yeah. Like PyCat talked about, once I started noticing you saying it, we went back, I watched replays, I started noticing there was a theme in their drafting. It's just make it as easy as possible for your players, something that everyone understands. For the mid player, for example, they draft the same heroes over and over again. Do you know what they were? Uh, Medusa, Death Prophet. They just go to these two heroes over and over again. And they're yeah. like, let's make this as easy as possible. These are heroes that you're very comfortable with. And maybe when you get to the finals, I, I started to notice this pattern. Like, when you're this kind of predictable team, in the finals, you're going to have some issues. Like, yeah. if you remember CDC, even you guys, 
uh, for sure. at TI6. Maybe you get predictable at the end and the right. better team will come out on top. But for the most part, it's going to carry it you works. throughout the tournament. I would rather get second doing the same thing over and over again than getting busted out in the groups. So, so to kind of, lo like, long story short, be comfortable. You don't have to take these kind of, like, these risks in the draft. Yeah, maybe Liquid, with their diversity, can win this tournament. Well, when you talk about this outdrafting, I think there are there, there are a few different ways that you can outdraft someone, you know? It can be... Um, so one thing one thing we did, uh, TA6, was that we, we would pick a hero that was generally played as a core role or yeah. as a support in our first pick. Um, when we were second pick, we'd take, like, the one, two, and then we'd pick uh, some hero, and then... In the last pick, because as a second pick team, you have the last pick. And then we'd pick another hero that could go in the same lane, but that was usually played as the other one. So we'd switch the three and the four. I see. And when you get that last pick, sometimes some team, you just can't deal with that. It's like the it's like when you play a lot of heroes without AoE and then last pick comes Broodmother. You know, you're what are you going to do against this Broodmother? You're not going to do anything, you know? You're going to lose that game. And there, like, there are many ways about drafting. I think... Uh, LFY's uh, way of kind of uh, drafting a team is it's a very kind of safe way. Yeah. But it's not so much, I think, like a, a big outdraft in that sense. It's more of a they're getting into their comfort zone a lot and they get what they want kind of regardless. But Liquid, I would say, more so is a team that outdrafts their opponents. They just pick a lot of these yeah. broodmother prophets and people just can't deal with it. They don't have enough answers. They don't have the tools to deal with those heroes. So, so Liquid seem to be the uh, eyes drawn to Liquid, Quinn, as the team that has the diversity to truly win the draft, in air quotes. Yeah, I think um, I think Liquid, their their last picks are very on points whenever they have these games where you're sort of racking your brain for what well, would be a good pick here and nothing yeah. really looks that good. And then suddenly they pick some hero and you're like, oh, wow, that's a good hero. Um, these surprising heroes, you know, the last pick PA, Zeus, mm. uh, for Miracle, these, you know, pretty situational heroes, uh, but they pick them, you know, in the right games and it ends up, like, working very well. I think almost more important than, like, you know, making an outdraft or things like that is just having a good idea of, like, how you want to play the game and not getting so wrapped up in specific heroes or, you know, things like that, but having a good idea of your play style. You know, for, like, LFY, like Blitz said, they stick to a couple heroes, a very, you know, similar play style for all those heroes dp medusa these five man centric heroes very good at taking towers and they play the a similar style so it keep you know like he said it sort of keeps it simple keeps it concise and everyone's on the same page because they know the style they're playing so almost just the answer we've kind of we've come to over this discussion the, with, with the, my brain trust uh is that you just have to be self-aware you have to know your you know yourself know your team on, you know, if, when it, if it comes to the two cores, if it comes to the entire unit, if it comes to the draft, it's just being self-aware and understanding where your strengths and weaknesses lie. So basically just being mature and being good at Dota certainly helps as well. Does that sound like a good way to summarize it, Will? Yeah, it's a pretty good one. I mean, I'm just... Self-aware Dota. Yeah, because I'm looking at my experience, especially with Liquid, it's last year they were a very rigid team yeah. in that sense. I mean, if you watch Liquid play, you knew what they were going to pick. They were going to get to the finals every time, yeah. but when they dealt with the team that had a little bit more flexibility, like OG, like these secrets that could just play it all, then it became really difficult for uh, for that squad. And you're going to see that time and time again, especially at an international. Maybe a team like LFY is in the finals, but it's going to be a team like BP, OG, or Liquid that meets them there. Because of what they what they can bring to the draft and bring to the game. Exactly. Um, talking of game, we're actually getting closer. Uh, let's go ahead and remind everyone at home what you have to look forward to across the four streams. If you haven't been making the group stage games over the first couple of days, don't panic. Indeed, this is what you have to look forward to. EG Secret, you've got uh, TNC going up against IG, you've got Fnatic Empire, and we talked all about what Fnatic and Empire have to do to keep their head above water, and LGD Infamous as well. I'm sure, uh, Piket, you would have no problem explaining to me why that fan favorite on stream one is going to be explosive. I mean, that's, I think it's always been one of those matchups people have just enjoyed. It's, yeah. those, it's like two big brands, and <clears throat> I think... Uh, EG Secret, yeah, you have these, you have all these players that are very known. You have Puppy. I mean, in the past it was Puppy versus like PPD, and you also have now it's 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 mid one versus Sumail. Yeah, it's just, it's these are fun players to watch. They're, you know, they like to they like to bring the action. Those two especially, I think, 
they're explosive players and yeah, it's it's always it, fun to see those teams yeah. match up. The mid lane is that where your attention is drawn on CCNC, especially as I mean a mid player yourself when you get to see kind of mid one battle Sumail trying to overcome the titanic mid laner that is Sumail. Yeah, I think they're both teams that play around their mid player. The safe lanes, you know, RTZ playing a more sacrificial role recently, and MP always playing these, you know, not very farmy heroes, mm. static, and they, you know, the space maker uh, on the team. So I think the the game generally for both teams is centered around their mid players. I think the TNC IGV game draws my eye even more than that one, uh, yeah. just because of. Like, they're both sort of these mid-range dark horses. Both teams can make it into the top four, and it's not really for certain uh, which one will make it there yet. So this could be quite a very good uh, kind of litmus test of who is going to be the one to... Yeah, uh, I think so. The odds. Okay, interesting. So that'll be on stream two. You can go ahead and check that one out. It's very simple. You'll be able to find them all uh, very, very easily and switch between them. Or even multi-twitch, you can watch all four at the same time if you're a mastermind. I tried it, it's not as easy as it sounds. Um, but Secret EG, I'm just going to be looking for kind of uh, a yes or a no. Do we have a real split series on our hands here? Is there a chance that we can see Secret Secret against EG? It has to be quick, Pycan. Just give me a yes or a no. I think EG takes it. EG takes it nice yeah. and easy. Yeah. EG, we said there were slow starters on day one. That was how we summarized it. However, it's not going to be happening this time unless Secret bring the pain. Indeed, let's jump into it. It is four games, four different streams, and it is our third day here for TI7 Groups. Let's jump in, though, here on the main stream as we get to see Secret Battle versus the Evil Geniuses.
Seeker do seem a little light on the reliable crowd control, though. You know, there's Fissure, there's the Burrow Strike. Meanwhile, you have... Boat Vacuum Torn Bolt? Yeah. It, it's I mean, like, that's a Womble combo. If unreliable, though. If you hit yep. the combo. I, I, the Vacuum Womble combo sounds really good on paper until you realize Kunkka has a lot of, like, delay between his spells. Um, he X and then he waves the sword a bit, the torrent comes out. Get that agonims for the Kunkka? You know, the, the double vacuum? <laughs> maybe, Wombo maybe down combo. the line. But <laughs> the important point to mention is that this is a lot of time for Shaker or Sand King to easily disrupt that kind of chain of spells coming out from Kunkka with the long range fissure or long range burrow strike. So that's going to be something that we have to watch out for. Um, team Secret, if they could get an Aether Lens on Kunkka, I think their team fight will, will kind of increase uh, in effectiveness, drastically, in fact. Oh. And we're going to see. Oh, wow. I, I basically look at this game, like, Ooh. going into that last pick, Lumi, there's, like, eight melee heroes. Weaver is very short range. Batrider is basically in the middle of the fight. So already Earthshaker and Sand King are amazing. Now you have an Enigma. Like, all of the secret heroes need to be in the middle of the fight right now. Maybe Kunkka can sit back and throw out nukes, but ideally you want to be running at people yep. with ion shells, and that is what Enigma punishes perhaps better than anyone else. But can we talk about the lanes real fast? Is yes. This, <laughs> so, Let's talk about the lanes. Is this a mid-shaker, mid, mid -shaker, right, from I guess it, It's looking like a mid-shaker, uh, a safe lane Lycan, I guess? Yeah, we have Universe on the Batrider, you have Zai on the they Enigma. Is it Jungle Enigma then? Yeah, I mean, we then... have seen, I think he do try to jungle Batrider one time. Uh, was it an MDL? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, and it's, crit it's just it's like a little all greedy. Place. The yeah. lanes are going to be a little weird for EG, but can Secret punish it is the question. Ooh, okay. They want to try. This to me is a we see you being a little greedy with your picks. We want to be active, roaming early, running at you quickly, yep. and not letting EG's farm machine kick in. Well, here's the thing. I, I think Sumail in particular is going to have a very tough lane now. The last pick of the Clinks is going to dominate Sumail in the mid lane. Normally, when, when that situation happens, you're like, okay, support's going to rotate and help. But you have a level one Sand King and Universe. Looks like Batrider is. It is. A, uh, a oh, they're swapping Bat around. Jungle Batrider. I think so. Okay. Now, now that that I, makes the lane a little bit better. Like you could go into mid lane and napalm him a little bit. But still, I think mid one is gonna dominate Sumail here. On paper, I think Secret's draft could completely run over EG because they're they just they come online so early right as soon mm. as you have a couple points in ion shell spirit breakers like level two to three he starts running at you with the dark seer double ion shell you can at least force these heroes off lanes cut creeps maybe kill them um clinks as soon as he hits like that level six seven area he can start punishing heroes that are off in the jungle farming uh weaver obviously can apply pressure in the lanes but i also feel like secret have to get a lot done in that stage if this yep. turns into a longer war of attrition a far more if eg are allowed to group up get their key levels and items. Good luck taking team fights against them. Good luck stopping them from taking Roche or a tower. Yeah, I think you made a critical point where is that Secret has the lineup to, to go ahead and stay ahead, but they have to do that. Look at how much base defense they have, or rather how little base defense they have. <laughs> what What is the game plan when Lycan is munching her tower on, you know, sieging tier three? You have a core and a clinks. Very good offensively taking a tower, but let's so interfending. The, the game plan is you kill the wolf while he's still a cub. You okay. don't let the wolf grow up. All right. Let's see if uh, that is indeed what Team Seeker will do. So Yapsor will be TPing out top to start things off as Team Secret look to get their early wards down. Secret, as mentioned, I would say it's at least, they at least need one game this series. I would say that's a must. Ideally, you want to, if they go 1-1 one, one against EG, then ideally they're looking at 2-0s against uh, their last two opponents, Liquid and Fnatic, in order to finish with a 9-7 a record. Now, that's that. even that's a tall task. So, you lose 2-0 here, you're in a lot of trouble. So, Secret definitely looking for that first game. Perhaps this could be it. As Puppy will get his wards down. Same already done by EG. Yep. Now, one thing you touched on towards the end of the draft is that EG does want to go sort of late. Uh, with their Enigma last pick, there isn't really a reliable way to cancel the Black Hole. Yes, the uh, Adaptive Strike can go through it, even through the BKB, but like you mentioned... Adaptive Strike? Uh, sorry, the Nether Strike. <laughs> I was like, okay. What? Adaptive Strike, a very different hero on I a mean, we different just had, spell. We just had the time, the time travel hub, and yeah, I'm wondering yeah. if like there's some glitches in the continuum, and this is actually TI2. We're, we're playing that mode where you could draft different spells on different heroes. I don't even know what that mode is called. Anyways, my point I was trying to make is that Nether Strike will cancel the Black Hole through BKB, but the problem with that is Spirit Breaker is likely to be in the middle of the fight as the fight begins, right? So I, I'm not sure how, how reliable that, uh, that plan is. 
for Team Secret. The lanes will get started here. The last time we saw the Sumail Shaker mid, it was in a melee versus melee matchup. It looked like a last minute audible uh, when they did that as well, and it completely crushed the lane. But this time, Secret are prepared. They picked the clinks, so not going to really be as easy for him to just come in and give him the totem. Uh, Crit is going to help him out a little bit. A very interesting starting item here from mid one, Ring of Basilius. When's the last time you've seen somebody leave the base with the Ring of Basilius in a pro game? Yeah, normally you complete it in the lane. That's a little unusual. Oh, he, he can't complete it in this lane, so yeah. I guess that explains a lot of that. Perhaps worried about a courier snipe, so... Yeah. And Crit starting off in the lane is the Batrider. Uh, this yeah. is what he did when he was playing the support Batrider previously. I think it was like a month or so ago. Uh, he spent a lot of time laning, he was really far behind, and he basically never came online because the rest of the team also had a tough showing early. So we'll see if things recover. Crit, just moving forward, trying to zone mid one out. Here comes a magic stick for mid one. So I wonder, seeing the magic stick, whether Crit says, okay, I'm, I'm, I've done my job. He's got a stick now, so my harass is not going to be too effective. I'll, I'll just leave. For now, he's going to napalm inside the trees. To not give away the stick Pretty charges. tough matchup for the Shaker, right? Like, you really... If, if if there's no Batrider here and you've got the threat of that Torrid coming in, the Klinks is just peppering you with Searing Arrows from range, like, you're never getting close to him without help. I mean, that's why the Bat is here, right? right. If you look at the CS, like, he's actually leading in terms of CS. 8-3 and three to the 4-0 and of Klinks. So far, the game plan for the laning stage for, for EG is looking pretty good. Yeah, they're, they're getting a lot of CS. Of course, their supports are... Not having the best time, especially crit, but Sankane's starting to jungle now. Zai did grab the level one sandstorm, and you can see already some stacking happening here for crit. Runes are about to spawn, and it will be a double damage rune top. Amps are going to lay claim to that. So, oh, actually going to let mid one grab it. So, yeah, EG actually doing pretty well here early. Like, for me, the big... To me, the big move that will probably decide the, the mid game and the course of this match is assuming nothing crazy happens to the lane stage, Lumi, is that jungle invasion. Do they get early powers? They are looking for the first blood here. Diving Arteezy, MP, pressuring him. Does have the Sakuchi cooling down, but Zai stands strong and forces them back. Takes over the lane, at least for now, giving Arteezy a chance to salvo. On paper, uh, I think EG does have that early game push, like you're mentioning. They have Eidolons, they have Wolves. How on the Eidolons? That's a lot of burst damage that you can put on buildings. I really like the fact that Puppy is down here. He, he did not start in this lane. Uh, but it's important, because I don't think the Weaver by himself could keep down the Lycan. Lycan sitting at 4 HP regen per second will likely level Pharaoh Impulse up again. I don't think Weaver could actually pierce through that much regen. So it is important for Puppy to walk up here, give him the 17% a little bit, and, and pressure RTZ. Because you would love to trade farm uh, as a Lycan here against a Weaver. Sumail is seeing like a boss. You know, you, you'd think the Clinks can really harass and slow down the Shaker. Not the case. 20 and 7 already. Yeah. That, that matchup is not really working out as intended for Secret, especially considering they committed the Kunkka. Meanwhile, Kezu uh, breaking relatively even here against the Universe is getting out tonight a bit. But there is not like a clear lane win happening around the map right now for Secret, which again, it makes it more and more about that jungle invasion. Right. And that early pressure when EG try to play a little greedier. And the narrative that we had during the, the draft is that Secret needs to pull a little slightly ahead, right? Because they pick heroes like Clinks to be the chorus. We're going to see a charge happening in the mid lane, but likely just a, uh, a harassing one. The Gigi's very comfortable with the way these lanes are unfolding thus far. Oh, for sure. Any adjustments from Secret that you would like to see, Lumi? I, I don't think there's any kind of big lane swap that you could do to kind of salvage any lane. I think it's kind of... Unfortunate how the lanes are going, and they need to just pick up kills with Yapzor as well as uh, Puppy. Which, unfortunately for them, they are unable to pick up any, because Sanking and, and Batrider are some of the tougher supports that you could roam on right now. Oh, Sanking just continuing to sandstorm away in the woods while Puppy scouts out crit. Both supports trying to farm the jungle now. This would ideally be around the time when you want to start striking if your team's secret, but Klinks is not ready for that yet. He's only level 4. The Weaver, same thing, only level 4. So, at best they can probably do is Leech. They think about bringing in Yapsor, but he has second thoughts and rotates back towards bottom. So, Kurt just idly, for now at least, standing by while EG continue to play their greed game. 
Sankey making the rotation up top. Sneaks past behind some tree line. Huh? Sumail's in a little bit far here. Could be an opportunity charge coming in. Puppy wants to go. He gets the bash. Yapsor's in position, but mid one didn't like the look of that dive. He backed off me while in the top lane. Zai committing and will find Kezu. That's the first blood. Yep. He was farming, but he quickly leaves the lane. And that is the beauty of how EG like to play is that they, they seem to balance that greedier farming play with like making just enough moves to apply pressure and you know relieve some from the lanes for their cores. It's just really hard to play against this playstyle by by uh, EG because their supports are constantly missing off the map. And then at Secret, you're like, okay, are they jungling or are they just ganking me? And, you know, charge happening. Torrent and then the follow-up charge. Burrow out. Can he get away? Surging forward, but the Spirit Breaker stunned. Malif is preventing him from getting maximum value out of that surge. Can't even get onto the Sand Cane in a 3v2. They fall short. Another... Disappointing outcome for Secret and Oh, more pain. Salt in the wound now as mid one gets fissure blocked away by Sumail. Snags that prized taste rune. Klinks has caught up in CS, so that is some good news for Secret. But still only even with the Earth Shaker. Not ahead as you would like. Yeah, and Shaker hitting level six is gonna be huge, especially with a haste rune. I'm gonna look for a Sanking rotation here from Zai. They could easily pop that haste, walk up with the Echo Slam and then set up a Burrow Strike, and that is a dead Klinks. In fact, I think Klinks probably should start jungling and give the lane to Yapsor, because that gank is extremely, extremely likely. Puppy's gonna make his next move, this time towards bottom. Looking to dive Arteezy. Ideally, you'd love to see that Spirit Breaker moving with the Ion Shell on him, but not gonna be happening this time. Easy hugging the tower, playing defensively, does get charged, but Zai's already ready to cut this off, gets the two-hero burrow, kills off Puppy, punishes him for his insolence, and mid one has to back away. So they commit both cores to this rotation. They're two beefy carries, and they might lose one of them here. Mid one and Viz, do they have detection? No, they don't. Doesn't look like it, but nonetheless, EG wasting a lot of secret time coming out on top in these exchanges. Having this ward in the river, very common one at this stage of the game, but seeing the charge from Spirit Breaker is the reason why they were able to make that rotation as cleanly as they did. There are the weak points in EG right now. Secret can't seem to find any. They're going to charge in mid. They look for Sumail, but the oh, Echo interrupts the charge. Get the hell out of here, puppy, he says. A fairly big cooldown expended, but of course, keeping himself alive means the phase boots can come out or perhaps They'll just save and go directly into the Blink Dagger. Likely going to see in uh, phase first. Yeah, he has it finished. And then most likely we're going to go into the Blink next. No surprising build whatsoever. So has a haste rune though. I wonder if EG looked to make a move with that. No smokes currently. And now the charge will be attempted on Universe. And this is the tricky thing for Secret is Puppy's really got his work cut out for him, Lumi. Like wherever you charge, there's so many heroes that get interrupted. Universe can Maleficent you, the Sand King can Burrow Strike you, the Earthshaker can Fissure. Uh, we saw yesterday the Flame Break did interrupt a charge, so while it doesn't cancel TPs, I guess it still works against the charge. There's a lot of ways to disrupt this initiation from Puppy. I think that really the big problem for Spirit Breaker is that the lanes on its own are not winning. When you have advantage, advantage lanes, the lanes by themselves are already putting so much pressure, and then the Spirit Breaker could be so mobile across the map and apply even more pressure at these pressure points. The problem is, Secret are essentially losing all three lanes, and what we saw yesterday when I believe it was, I want to say, Execration that picked uh, Spirit Breaker, exact same situation. Spirit Breaker by mid-game just felt like it wasn't even a hero, it was just a big melee creep couldn't apply any pressure anywhere, didn't do anything, and just quickly fell off. And I, I can't feel, but that's the same situation happening out for, for Puppy right now. This is around the time where I thought Secret would want to really start taking over the map, invade the Radiant Jungle, try and take a tower down early, shut down all the farming patterns. But Arteezy is farming freely in the woods for now. Crit looks like he's headed back to the woods. Already hit level 5. Universe uncontested in the top lane. Closing in on his Midas. Has the gold now for it. Sumel having a whale of a time in the mid lane. So just still trying to find really even that first slight crack of an opening. And they just can't seem to do it. And in fact, they might not get one now. As EG are showing signs of a five-man rotation towards the top lane. 
The warding has been impeccable. I mean, yep. you mentioned the one ward bottom. They might be able to get Sumail here, though. This could be huge. He's a bit isolated from his team. The lone cow could be punished. Charging for Puppy gets the bash. Needs a little bit more. Kanka coming in with the Torrent as well. Trying to lock him down. They need that Shaker. He walks back in. He gets up the Echo. He gets up the Totem. He's going to kill mid one. Oh, not good. Not good for Secret. Stays alive. Sumail, the cojones on this one. That is painful, Lumi. Dude, the man up. Like, he knew he was going to die if he tries to run anyway, so minus one fight for his teammates available. Zai, to me, MVP so far at every single fight to just counter-initiate. Man, you said yesterday we need a... Uh, what is that? The, 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 the Spidey Sense Award for, for players? Yeah, we were joking, you know, <laughs> like if there were new, new hexagons nowadays, you know, maybe one of the categories would be Spidey Senses. Uh. <laughs> and then... Man, the Spidey sense on Zion. EG's like, ab like, you know, their, their MMR might be a little bit lower than Liquid's, but uh, right now I'm feeling like their Spidey senses is pretty On top of things, yeah. for sure. Yeah. <laughs> so they do seem to have Secret figured out a little bit this game. Like, the warding position has been perfect. The rotations have been on point. Uh, and they're also out farming them all the while. So. Middle, we're going to see Yapsor on the run here. Charge is going to come through here from Puppy. It looks like he will be fine. And... This goes back to something I mentioned during the, the drafting stage. Now, as a mid-game approaches, you're seeing a, a level 6 Kunkka, barely going to pick it up, and then a level 4 Spirit Breaker. These two supports really to be want to be like 7 or 8 by this point, or soon after. They want to have a kill. Yeah, like you they want to get something done. You don't pick Clinks and Weaver as your cores, and Spirit Breaker back with back. a Darkseer to not have kills, but finally there you'll go. get one. Universe taken down top. There's an early hood pick up here for Kezu, and there's a lot of magic damage on EG. For sure. And the silver lining for Secret is that while all this, these shenanigans were happening up towards the top side of the map, they did finally take that bottom tower. That, to me, is actually extremely important. These outer towers, probably more so than the kills, cutting down on where EG feels safe to farm when they have five heroes that are great at it is a huge way to limit their economy heading into the mid game. I, I think taking the mid tower would, would be more important to the point that you made. If you could invade their jungle with the mid tower down, that's much, much better. But okay. beggars can't be choosers. They are down and maybe... W one thing that Kling's lineups can do is you could just backdoor tier one towers. Your damage output is so f so high. Uh, maybe not with the level one strength, but maybe in a couple of minutes, uh, he could start thinking about that. He's going to go back for a Midas here, so mid one, not trying to rush the Desolator, got the casual medallion. It's the value damage slash potentially rush item if they have a really decisive team fight. But the key for a Clinks has always been stay off the map, you know, constantly farm the jungle, be a threat to gank, try and force your opponents by your absence to clump up, to farm less freely. And mid one definitely doing a good job of that right now. Oh, I think but you also have to balance that with, you know, actually getting some farm. You can't just constantly not be farming and off the map. Look at the three hits, chunking crit down. The charge is going to get canceled. I think that was a miscommunication uh, from C Secret. Puppy was charging, and now the Blink Dagger reveal. Echo comes in, but that Clink's pretty tanky. Not the easiest takedown and will be alive. Yaps are there to break the lasso. Nicely played, and now trying to run away. The charge through. Puppy pile ducks crit back. Just leave my bone Fletcher away, he says. But, no, oh, Spirit Breaker going to go down here. As Sumail comes in for round two, Fisher's there, it traps in mid one, almost but not completely. He squirms away, Clink's has been losing weight, what little he has left. And now, Zai low in the river, but EG only losing the bat as a trade for the Spirit Breaker. That was the Blink debut. Could have been worse, and you know, I think does showcase one of Clink's strikes that he has a deceptively tanky core. He also had the boat buff on him, which yeah. made, made him uh, super tanky. Oh. First kind of slight victory here for Team Secret. Although did not get any towers or objectives out of that. And that's going to be the game plan for Secret for the next five to 10 minutes. Get a small kill here and there, pressure towers. Because we know the economy game for for EG is just much better. They, they got the Enigma, they got the Midas running. He's approaching to level 15. Oh, top gank. look at mid one. Guardian MP here, there's gank. a top gank. Yep. We'll take down Puppy. One constantly trying to deal with this Batrider and his persistence pays off. Gets the kill. That might be the mid tower. That would be huge. He's going to trelay into it now. Strafe not available. Already used it for the kill. But those Searing Arrows do quite a bit of work. EG, have to imagine, will be They're coming straight down. to defend this. They're walking through a scan, though. They were clipped by it. It's a secret. Should know this is coming. They back away. They look for the reset. And one using that medallion to help him farm Ancients. 
Once again, I think we're gonna set up a gank here for on Kezu up top. No shapeshift this time. Sumail does not have Echo yet. He's gonna try to start with an Enchant Totem. Fissure comes through, hits the Dark Seer. That's not the target he wants. Now the Enchant Totem back on the Spear Breaker, but I think the jig is up, and Sumail wants to get the hell out of dodge. Still though, tanking some searing arrows, dropping low. He's still what a extremely, burrow. extremely durable, but pulled back into the vacuum. The boat, the pain for EG as they lose hey. two critical team fight heroes. That is the Wombo combo that we're talking about, and man. So to think I doubted it, Lumi. Yeah. Yabzor has been on point. As soon as he got that level four X marks a spot, it's just X nonstop and it's just beautiful for these kind of small skirmish. We do see mid one backdooring the tier one as Puppy pushes crit away. It is really so much of the game is about this tower and that tower top. Taking those down opens the way to Roshan. Yep. It, it allows them to invade EG's jungle. Like that is, if you were writing a script for Secret, those would be the two most important things uh, the Roshan and these tier ones mid and top. We're going to see that fight one more time and look at the beauty that is the vacuum torrent boat combo. You used to make highlight videos, or we're not going to watch that anymore because there's a fight in the river as we have Batrider getting cleaned up. Crit is getting punished a lot. He's been, you know, running around on his own trying to be that, you know, roving X-Factor that can set up ganks or at least assist his teammates when they're being dove. But mm -hmm. it's tough to get away with that against the Clinks. Mid one's constantly tracking him in the river. Clinks and a spear break. He's also setting up vision for the charges. So it's a nice yeah. little synergy between these two heroes that Secret have been able to exploit. I mean, he's playing on the Batrider, but uh, assume he's kind of on like a Crystal Maiden or Vengero, right? Like, you're just playing the five, you're trying to ward and, and create space for your team, and that's going to happen against these two very aggressive roamers. As you can see, mid one again, charging. Zai is the next to be caught out, and this is where having those towers down is oh so sweet. But he's charging through a ward, so Zai is aware of the situation. But does it matter? MP's going to get onto him. No teleport scroll on Zai. This could be trouble even without the Spear Breaker actually connecting. One Searing Arrow, almost half his health down. MP wants to chase. He's committing for this. It's going to take a couple volleys of auto attacks to get the job done. He time lapses out. Not quite in time. Meanwhile, and now MP in danger. He's on the run. Yeah, so Spirit Breaker charged through an entirety of EG, so he just died, and now they're going to try to cut down EG. What a visual block! Traps MP in. Sakuchi's down. No time lapse, and he's going to get burned down. Vacuum Bull. Torn! Huge Jackal Slam to take down the Weaver. The bolt's going to come in. They will take down RTZ as a trade. Can they get a little bit more? Yapsor getting in position here for more XC. for the X. Glimmers himself. Finds the X here on Sumail, and will connect the torrent. Universe does have Black Hole along with the Blink. Secret got to be careful not to group up. Yep, so sitting back. <laughs> one and it is just in time. He is able to do so now. Jumping forward, Puppy commits onto Sumail. Sumail is in trouble being overrun. EG's position has been completely compromised. Three down. Wait, how did that Black Hole? On. How did that Black Hole cancel? I believe it was Yapsor just quickly... Uh, no, he didn't do anything. He didn't do anything. Yeah, I, I think he saw Yapsor. I was like, okay, well, I'm, there must be a torrent coming, but there wasn't anything, so yeah. he cancelled himself because the X-Torrent came after the Black Hole got cancelled onto the other targets. Well, now, we'll granted... We'll I see if we have a chance for a replay here, yeah. but either way, the push is on. Secret working on the Tier 2 tower. They're going to take this down. The way to Roshan is certainly looking a lot more open now. The Desolator on, under construction momentarily for mid-1. Oh, we're we'll gonna get the replay. At. X Torrent back. Yeah, so starts the fight on Sumail. Uh, set this up with like a glimmer walk in, then Puppy gets in, the black hole comes through. And, and he just. Is this a vacuum by Kezu, maybe? Oh, uh, it could be. You're right. I'm not I, sure. I'm not. <laughs> There's a lot of purple in there, so. Yeah, okay, right. so. And in any case, great fight yeah. by Secret. Uh, they, they get some key kills. They're also not allowing EG to set up their full combo, and they're taking these early scrappy fights. That is what you want to be doing mm -hmm. uh, if you're in their position. And they're getting objective off of these fights, which is important for Secret. Again, they, they cannot play on the back foot. EG's got the better late game. They got the better scaling hero. And for now, uh, Secret should start to look at Roshan. Keep in mind, they do have the medallion on, on mid one, and they have nothing but burst physical damage. So Rosh would be very easy. EG trying to calm down here, reset for the next fight. But the vision is starting to become a problem for them. Is constantly secret. No, when EG are off in the jungle farming and the greed is being punished. Charging for a puppy, looks for the lockdown, trying to cage the wolf, pumping in the Syrian arrow damage. Mid one scores the kill. And secret, find another. Yep. This is what the draft was designed to do. Just 
take over the jungle, not allow EG to play their farm game, not allow them to group up for fights. And so far, mostly according to script, but Lumi, with a lineup like this for EG, one fight can always change everything. And they have, you know, a wombo tools. combo of, of their own, right? Blink Black Hole with the epicenter on top with the Echo Slam. EG rotating up top. You'd like to see Hero port back to defend, get the quick kill and push. And guess who's porting back? It's Kazu. Not really the hero they want to go on. With a completed pipe, a mech almost ready. Actually, Greaves not too far off. He is an extremely tanky force. Basically a walking, a walking hospital for the squad. Interesting to see Yapsor going for the Glimmer Cape and then into a Blink Dagger. Not the item progression that you see too often, but Yapsor loves these kind of high mobility items. It's been pretty much chewing on all the tomes as well. Yeah, he's got, at this point, all of his key abilities fully leveled up. Max Torrent, Max X, two points in the boat. Also, the Torrent Talent. Normally, you see some of the greedier Kunkka going for the uh, physical damage talent, so you could just neutral a little bit better, but... That's playing into EG's hands, right? Yeah. You, I, don't, I, I, you don't want to be spending too much time farming. Yeah, like, like we've been mentioning, you know, they live and die by their skirmishes. They win those fights and get objectives. Surprised to see that Secret hasn't made a Roche attempt just yet. Maybe they're thinking about taking the mid tier two first and then and then go back for it. Yeah, it's scary to walk into the pit. Even with the, the towers being down, EG are so good at fighting in those claustrophobic areas. So Secret instead, they'll smoke. They'll look for an opening, but EG are playing yeah. this one safe. They tuck back behind their tier twos. They go for the Roche now, but Lycan has a wolf in it. RTZ on point here with his micro. And this is why in bygone days, teams always bought a gem. And EG immediately smoke up. Lycan. Puppy breaks a smoke though. Here we go. Size in first. He gets the burrow. It's only on one and not really the easiest target to take down with Kezu having the mech, having the pipe, and the arrows come blazing in, taking out Zai quickly. RTZ tries to man fight, but that's not going to happen until Universe is there. The X was already committed. The vacuum though is there to cancel the black hole and now Secret are on the warpath. They're gonna turn for crit. They look to bring him down. Big commitment from Sunel. The totem will end MP. Still though, mid one stays alive. A three for two and it's with all the ults expended. They might lose Sumail. Oh. Two more auto techs. Epsor, he's, he's got not again. giving up the ghost yet. On oh, the wait. chase, he didn't quite get it off in time. He had a vision, he had a ward. I'm not sure what happened there. I think he was mid cast animation. Yeah, and he, and just, he blinked just blinked out away. of time. So it was truly a game of seconds there. Well, But they expended a lot of ults and they did not win the fight. Round two at the Roche pit should certainly be secret favorite. Yeah, secret. Uh, mid one is gonna death pack a big creep now. He's gonna get a ton more HP. They're gonna walk right back into it, pop the shrine along. I don't think EG could challenge it a second time. We're gonna see that team fight one more time. The boat came out before the black hole did. So even though the black hole looked pretty good for half a second, nobody was losing any HP because of the boat buff. And RTZ was just taking way too much physical damage. The X and the vacuum dealing with universe. Yeah, Kezu really came up big in that fight as well. Also, they, they initiated on the Darkseer with a pipe and Greaves. Like, that is not the best hero to start the fight on. EG still want to contest this, though, but Zai will be ushered away. Puppy's there with the charge. No siree, he says. Gets the bashes. Now the boat coming in Ooh. actually connects on Zai. The urn's there as well, but he's going to shrine up. Gets back to safety. And let me, I think this has probably been an, a real, one of the most interesting developments to me over the last six months is that no team gives up Roche for free nowadays at TI. Like, even if they're down 10, 15k gold, unless they are physically being pushed away from the pit, there's always someone with a Blink Dagger or Storm or another mobility here who's, like, trying to sneak in, especially if they're support. And, like, even if they probably die 9 times out of 10, yeah. that 1 out of 10 where they snatch the Aegis, teams have decided it's worth the risk. For any game that is, like, close in contention, that's definitely the case. I, I remember we were casting the Cloud9 game yesterday. They were down by, like, 20k. They gave up the Roche. <laughs> they, weren't, they weren't finding that one, but... We didn't, I, I, cast, we didn't cast Cloud9 this day, did we? Yeah, we did. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Cloud9. Or was it maybe the day before? Yeah, was, yeah, I think it was the day before. Okay. But I t completely agree with you. Like, you don't give up Roche for free, especially the second one, giving the cheese. How many times have we seen, like, a, a Roshan being done by one team, and then the other team steals the Aegis and cheese, and the game just completely turns on that point, so... Meanwhile, we got, uh... Some necro books being farmed on the mid lane. So, so let's take a step back here. It's an, a moderate lead for Secret. They just got their prized Roshan. They denied EG. Overall game plan for Secret. 
Is there a timer on this team? What's their next objective? If they like had a script for how this game should play out from here, what would it be? It's the same script. Uh, it's the same kind of fight, and you just keep bringing it to EG. You don't give them any breathing room. Uh, your lineup is designed to apply pressure. I talked about Spirit Breaker as a pressure hero early on, and you just keep going. Uh, the Desol would help you take the objective on, on mid one, and they will likely finish the BKB first on Klings, and then start to try to finish the game. Whereas if, if you're EG fan, even though the game is currently not looking so well here for them, they still maintain high ground. They still maintain one of the best high ground defense with a BKB Black Hole, with the Bat Rider, and the Sand King. So I think both teams have a lot of ways to play uh, the remainder of the game still. Mid one banging on the front door as he lays into this tier two. You can see Zai is trying to do his Ooh. best split pushing job here. Top, but he is being charged by Puppy. He might not actually be able to TP out. It looks like he's in a lot of trouble as the sentry gets deployed. They're going to nether strike him back. Yaps are still in position. The damage is not the best from these two, but they slowly, slowly work the scorpion down. Ooh, he burrows he's... again in the tree. Meanwhile, in the river, the real fight breaking out as they've tried to get the power play going here. BG, though, still losing their enigma pretty early in the fight. Big commitment already. They dive MP. He scurries away. The wolf's time is being wasted, and his ult's about to end as Puppy sees opportunity. Charging in, gets denied by the Fissure, but mid one with the cleanup you know EJ are like we have this 4v3 in the river let's go fight but secret are just too tanky and too elusive to consistently wrangle them and not to mention even if you do they're usually not dying yeah I think the big problem that Enigma currently is facing is that you know when you see Enigma being picked you're always like okay black hole how's it gonna get canceled how many stuns can I BKB off things like that but the other kind of more barbaric way to cancel black hole is just to kill them and mid one is like, okay, every time I'm going to put my medallion on you, I'm going to strafe you, and you're going to just die. So Enigma normally likes to be build things like Octarine and things like that, and he has one on quick buy, but I think maybe a, a plate mail onto Shiva's guard is perhaps more effective for a game like this. I think what we're also seeing is just how integral the Darkseer and the way he's itemized has been to this game. Like, Kezu alone actually really punishes this five-man combo with yep. the Greaves, with the pipe, and also just with the Dark Seer's nature as a hero, the vacuum in the wall, excellent crowd control. And honestly, it makes it so that like EG is trying to play their game and their game is not necessarily even that favorable for them. Yeah. He is like the one man antidote to that combo. It at also helps for, that- At least for now. It also helps that EG is initiating onto the Dark Seer on these fights, as opposed to, you know, on the other guys and, and try to kill them quick. But it, it's like, it's hard either way, right? Because if you don't kill the Dark Seer, then he just mechs and pipes the rest of the team. So it's- you mentioned the Necrobook. We haven't really had a whole lot of time to breathe the last couple minutes, but I wanted to get your thoughts because the build nowadays for most Legend players is mid one tries to set up here and Zai might be able to quickly kill off the sand kid. He is on the chase. The charge comes through. The Burrow Strike committed. So no way to interrupt this. They're going to pull him back with the X. The Torrent marks his demise. But yeah, this Necrobook build has really fallen off in popularity. It's all about Armlet Mask of Madness. So do you, do you like the build? curious why Arteezy went for it this game. I mean, there's two Invis heroes on the other side. Just having the ability to have that detection always in team fights is quite good. And, but I do agree with you. I, I think the Mask of Madness armlet build plays better when you're ahead. The Necrobook, I don't know, it, it just feels so weak, especially when you're behind like this. It's obviously you're up against a Weaver and a Clinks, right? So that yeah. minus armor can be extra brutal. If you're running in and they're just hitting you with a Deso, a Medallion, like you're you're melting probably, but... X. On the flip side, the Necrobook minions also seem to be getting crushed. Yep. Clinks is happy to chew those up. Speaking Yapsor of which, has been missing a lot of his x Bolt combo, and now... But he has a BKB though, they've got to completely change that him. The vacuum interrupts and now mid one can turn if he needs to. Zai's low, the swarm hits him, and now Universe comes in. Decent to hero, black hole. Yapsor doesn't have a whole lot to deal with this, but the clicks is just dishing out damage into it. Still though, the team's getting overrun, still is not BKB. Mid one's now last one and controlled. BKB finally comes out, but it only marks his tomb. Now Yapsor on the run. Oh, secret. Not Ooh. respecting the EG combo. They're going to lose a fourth as the Kunkka wow. gets picked off to climactically end the fight. Yeah, Klinks got pushed away and he didn't activate his early BKB. It made sense there because even if he activated BKB and went in a fight, Universe was waiting for the Black Hole. So good patience by mid one to wait out the Black Hole. But unfortunately, he didn't have enough damage to kill the, uh, the Enigma. Enigma came in with full HP. 
We're gonna watch that fight one more time as mid one is just getting heavily pressured. He walks away, he walks away. Could easily activate the BKB here, but keeps on walking away because he knows that Enigma is coming with a black hole. He waits out the black hole and then tries to kill him, but not enough damage. And great fissure here from uh, the Shaker to break out his damage. I think had he activated the BKB to kill the Enigma, maybe that fight would have turned a little bit differently, but the rest of EG was coming in fast and hot. I mean, I think you at least give it a shot. You know, yeah, maybe yeah. it turns yeah, out sure. it's not enough damage and you still lose the fight, but you you don't go for this item to like save it for a rainy day. Those are the crucial fights that can decide the game. And so. you used it right, right before you died. That was a 10 second BKB. So yeah. that was definitely unfortunate for mid one, but secret. Well, what was once that 4K gold lead that they scrapped and clawed to achieve now basically a dead even game and they'll have to reset. And we do see, you know, that's a fight where, well, it is hard to deal with the black hole now that Enigma is BKB. They've been able to cancel it pretty quickly in two fights, but nothing really, unless somehow the Spirit Breaker can get a charge in. Right, or Nether Strike again, like I mentioned yeah. earlier. Um, do you think that that's how this game's gonna come down to? It's just like, how good are the black holes? How long he could channel it for? Uh, Secret are hoping that they could play it in such a way that it doesn't, but. I think it kind of feels like it does. When you've got right, veteran yeah. hands, like universes on the Enigma, yeah. it seems relatively unlikely he completely airballs those black holes. So I think it will certainly be one of the crucial factors that decides this game. So we do see Kezu going back for a Helm of the Dominator. We, we've seen a Darkseer, uh, I think yesterday when we cast it, um, went for this build. I mentioned how it's very easy to dominate a creep and then you could put the iron shell and, and farm with it. The added benefit in this game is that you could have a creep with you all time for mid one to actually eat. And that's pretty critical in some of these team fights when they break out suddenly. The dominated creep also is has more HP than the ones you find in the jungle. That's a so, good yeah, it seems like a really nice item synergy yep. with the team's heroes. There there's like it used to be a, a debate where if Klings would even build a helm for himself. Obviously, when your teammates build it for you and just eat it, much, much better for, for the uh, clinks. Reminds me of, was, wasn't there some crazy, like, 90-minute game last year in the group stage where, <laughs> was it MVP? I think MVP got, like, multiple Helms of the Dominator, and then they would just, like, start, like, if you re-dominate a creep, obviously, you lose the old you one. You disassemble it. Or, or they no, were, no, you they put would, it down. You just put it down. put it down. They would buy, buy a new one. Dominator, yeah. and then they would just surround the throne with, like, all these Dominator creeps. They were slowly building their army of the undead, but... Yeah. Yeah, I don't think we're going to see that this game. I, I famous, would hope famous, famous last. I one. would hope we see some 90-minute games. You know, I'm always down for that kind of stuff. Yeah, then you'll perk up. That is, Lumi's not a big coffee guy, but that is that, that is, is my natural coffee. coffee yeah, 90-minute games. Well, we're a third of the way there. As EG venture outside the base, they Yo. might be walking into. Secret. Look at what Yapsor's got queued up. I know you kind of brought up as kind of like a semi-joke, but he's got eggs queued up. Have you seen those highlight reels where like the Kunkka blinks next to a team and then like bolt backwards and then it's just like a vacuum bolt towards the team and then likely there's a torrent waiting, there's, you know, a vacuum wall waiting. We're going to see some you gotta, highlights. You got to put the put the shades on as you do that. <laughs> put your other eye patch on. Oh, well, that will impair your vision. How about you do it first, and then as it's going, then you, you put the shades on. They're going to try to start the fight on Puppy here. Fisher comes in from Sumail. The Yule Scepter to interrupt this chain of initiation. Now the Enchant Totem comes through, but they get scared and they back away as the Black Hole's committed, but it's on a BKB clicks. He's not taking too much damage. They can look to turn this. Chunking down Universe. Mid one gets his vengeance. Now turning on the Batrider as well. He pressed his BKB and Secret will deny EG here. Zai comes in late and he'll likely be the third down if Yepsor can get him, but he doesn't have the mana. It's Puppy charging through, connects on two. Also finding Sumail and addition to Zai. They'd love to grab additional kills, but even more than that, they would love to take this Roche. So you can see they all frantically scramble about and then they say, yeah, let's get an Aegis. Yep, the buyback had to be expended for that engagement. Puppy was in a great position charging back into the fight. Unfortunately, the rest of his team was on the high ground, so they could not take advantage of the fact that he was chain stunning essentially half the team by himself. Still though, Secret wins the team fight. They get Aegis and Cheese, and you know, they, they could kill mid one once. I don't know if they could kill him twice. Although the second time would be easier because he likely would not have a death pack. Or BKB. Yeah. Yeah, let's see if they can pull it off. They're down a black hole now, though. It is a pretty good time to push. However, beware the Echo Slam, which is still available for Sumail to deploy. 
as EG are going to tap the shrine, try and stay in fighting shape. They now make their move, jumping on to mid one. They want to crack him and mid break one. that Aegis early, and he will lose it. He was compromised up on the high ground. Really could have sat farther back. Double dust flying out. They're going to try. The boat's going to rescue them, but Burrow Strike from Zai is available. They want him, and they are going to get him. Lasso him back, and that is going to be killed through Aegis. And now EG, one of the best chasing team in the, with the Lycan, they will take down Puppy as well. That is a dieback. My man, mid one, why was he like, he was next to the melee racks trying to hit people. All right, well, he does actually have buyback, but yeah, that, that is a double death. I... I'm not really sure. I think just a bit over eager. They, they didn't need to kill heroes, right? Yeah. They could have just sat back. Clinks can strafe from distance. Weaver can plink. The rest of the heroes can wait and reserve because the one thing that could ruin them, the blink, black hole, BKB, is not available. Right. So if they go in for a lasso, like the Darkseer can counter initiate, the Kunkka can X you back. There's really no, you can approach that very you know, systematically in a very organized fashion, but they chose instead to just rush headlong into the base. Yep. It's and the, kind of the nature of how you want to play with a Spirit Breaker and with these heroes outside, but I don't think it's how you approach the Siege. Not not high ground, which surprises me greatly. This is a puppy-led team. Like, this is the one one point in the game where he's generally very good, you know, slapping his team a little bit. Don't don't go crazy, you know, systematic Siege. And then this happens. We do not encourage any physical violence. We do not. But that was a metaphoric backslap, you know, <laughs> it's just like, hey. Make sure we don't do anything throwy. That is a huge throw, in my opinion. A game that looked like very winnable in that position. It's for only teams. a throw if they lose, Lumi. It could be a huge throw. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I mean, now EG's got their black hole back. They got all of their spells back. Let's check if they have any smokes ready to go. Uh, nothing on the heroes yet. I'm not sure if EG is out of smoke and uh, the shop either. So that is going to be the next point of contention. Is there a point where it's just like too late for secret do you feel like at some at some stage of this game eg once they get enough items enough levels are just too strong in the late game or do you feel no matter how late this game goes that secrets lineup always can match up i i think uh secrets definitely got at least 10 to 15 more minutes i, I think once eg if they start itemizing for some hard way to kill the clinks whether it's like let's say abyssal blade on rtz or a hex coming out from one of these like rich eg cores then I think that gets like super hard for, for mid one and the rest of the secret. But for now, they, they still have a couple of team fights left. Secret. Desperately in need of a 2 0 to start the day. Still looking for that first game victory here. It's been back and forth, but for the first time in a long time, it is an EG advantage now. Up by a bit over a thousand gold, hugging their base, playing it safe, but. While they, most of the team is camped inside the base, you'll notice, like we saw earlier, Sand King was split pushing top. Right now, Batrider is deep in the dire tree line all the way to the north. So EG is always sending some sort of expedition out yep. to keep the lanes pushed, to cut the creep waves, and to try and eke out a bit of farm. So it's not like total turtling. It's like, you know, a hybrid turtle farm strategy. <laughs> It is uh, somewhat dangerous because, you know, we, we've seen Zai trying to do that earlier and then he's just charged. You know, there there is a clinks right on top of him. And speaking of Zai getting charged, that is exactly what's happening A right long now. way to go for the smoke gank. Zai just wants to farm a wave. And he will blink out in time, but still Puppy gets in range for the nether stick. The <laughs> burrow gets him out to safety. Zai coming out. Clutch there. And now EG's turn to smoke. They'll make their move instant. Reply that is putting on the shades escaping the gang. My goodness the timing on that All right, here mm. we go Perfect 10 out of 10 The wolf is leading the scouting party as it tries to get eyes on secret secret Have to be careful about this initiation. They don't have a gem currently and now in comes the fissure to start the fight follow-up Onto the darks here, the echo, hey. they commit, they hole as well, and running into it is the Spirit Breaker who can interrupt it. Universe gets up a butte, and the black hole overwhelms. Now, four have fallen, a complete route of secret. And now they have enough damage to kill through the uh, Darkseer. No pipe activation, no grieve activation. They just change sent him completely from 100 to zero. And it's EG going the other way. Secret go on to lose this game. They're going to be kicking themselves. Missed opportunities, overextensions, mistakes that were avoidable will come back to haunt them. It's not over yet, but EG certainly want to make it so. They are barreling down mid while we...
watch the tail end of that fight. Yep. Just again, the BKB, Blink, Black Hole, there is no real reliable reply, and two fights now, the universe has found an opportunity and taken it. Yeah, another strike was on cooldown. Remember, they used it on Sanking earlier just before that fight happened. So that's why Universe had no pressure whatsoever. And, and at now? some point, he's going to have a Lincoln Sphere, you know, if he feels like he is worried about right, another right. strike, at which point... At this point, it doesn't seem like he's even worried. He so hasn't even got cancelled. So EG, they'll take the Tier 3, the way to the Shrines now lies open. Mm -hmm. And they're not going to overextend. They know the Black Hole's on cooldown. They will focus on securing map control as they have a little shrine pounding party. Now, I don't need to Shoot tell off you... some fireworks and then get the hell out. I don't need to tell you that why map control is good, but in particular with the context of this game, keep in mind that Secret has been getting every single Roshan up to this point. Should EG be able to challenge and tech the next Aegis, I think that goes back to your previous question is, when, when is the hard GG? That is it, right? If EG has Aegis, I don't think Team Secret could win the, the fight after that. So this past five minute turn of events, you lose one big fight, you lose your tier three, you lose Shrine, you lose map control. Ice Frog forbids if they lose Roche, it is it is uh, lights out for Team Secret. Ice Frog forbids. Well, you don't know what religion people are, but you know, we're playing. Dota, I know what so. religion you are. Yeah, there you go. You, you believe in the one true frog. Give me that OS Frog voice. No, not the OS Frog. The OS Frog is an imposter. Oh, lady. okay. I see. I see. The OS Frog is a lesser creature. <laughs> the Ice Frog is the original, the great, the pure. You know, no amount of ice flattering. Ice Frog giveth an Ice Frog. No, no amount of flattering will let you cast the Grand Finals, right? Like, <laughs> you could just keep talking right now. It's just not going to happen. It's all about that TI-8 invite, Lumi. Okay. I'm just starting my campaign. Oh, I'm just starting my campaign. Prepping now. ahead. I, I like that. I like that. <laughs> But EG, I think, you know, as we've kind of been touching on, we'll continue to reinforce throughout the game. There's no rush for them getting, there's plenty of key items that they could still complete. Some damage items, perhaps, for Sumail, now that he's got all his utility. Zai, obviously, something like an Ags or Lotus Orb would be wonderful. Universe can get that Refresher or Lincoln Sphere. Crit, a BKB, and four staff, uh, eventually would be wonderful on the Batrider. Arteezy some point you probably replace that necro book still room for the abyssal there's lots of big items they can pick up and they're in no hurry yep where secret are feeling the pressure and feeling the heat crit sending a beautiful spot to break any kind of smoke rotation into their jungle and they're gonna just chill um also previously eg was playing around a huge cooldown of black hole but because he's got the 15 percent uh, cdr talent and also the octarine core He's looking at a 102 second cooldown on the Black Hole, which is very respectable for such a game-changing ultimate. Also, side note, 60 second cooldown on Hannah Midas. Mm, just 10 out of 10 as well. The cooldown reduction is such a big deal, especially when you combine it with the, yeah. the Octarine. Like, it's not, it's not quite every fight, but it's in those late game scenarios, oftentimes like you'll have to either take a Roche and then try to push a lane or, you know, just clear all the waves, push out the side lanes, then go down mid. You know, it takes a little while to get to your ideal staging point. And by that time, a lot of time, the black hole's either ready or the fight can start and it'll cool down in the middle of the right. fight. So, you know, that 100 seconds versus like the three minutes is, you know, a real game changer. I have no idea why Enigma's talents are, are the way that they are now. It, it almost should be where you get the 120 gold or the 15% CDR at level 20. And instead of instead F15. Of, yeah. I'm pretty sure that those are a little more game changing than the one Malefice instance. Because <laughs> getting getting the CDR at 15 means so much more because you, you're going to, the 15% CDR allows you Midas so many more times to get to the 20 and, and 25 and whatnot. But let's right. uh, have that debate for a different day as EG is. We'll put our Enigma chop shop on hold as EG make their move through the river, Ooh. lurking on the high ground. Arcane Roof. Our secret, and they were scouted by a Radiant Scan, but Yapsor's gonna jump in first, tries to bait something out. A little extra shenanigans for him. Now Sumail confidently lumbering up with the Shiva's Ooh. Echo Initiation. He gets the party started. Zai's there to follow up. Look for the hole. He's gotta find oh. the opening. That's three. Universe, you monster. How could you? Puppy and all his monitors are in shambles. Secret on the run completely overwhelmed.
He didn't get the Klinks, and he was taking quite a bit of damage, but his teams backed him up. They had a Disarm, they had a Yules. Klinks did not do any damage in that team fight. And with a big win, EG goes straight for the Raxxas. Backdoor protection be damned. They don't care. They're going to run it over. They could go for the GG if they want. They're going to go for the safe triple lane of Rax, or just a second lane of Rax. And this is an EG victory any way that you, you toss it. Stable, patient, and deadly late game. That was the EG draft. That was the game plan, and they executed it. Wasn't flawless, and I think you look back at this game, some of those key fights in the 20 to 30 minute range where Secret had a bunch of big successes, but then a few really critical mistakes. And perhaps that also speaks a little bit to the draft, Luby, where it's not that the draft couldn't work, but they couldn't afford to miss their windows. Yes. This EG lineup could make mistakes and still, you know, catch a second win, have a fresh take and a new opportunity. Secret really didn't have too much margin for error. Yeah, I think the Secret lineup is also like, like you mentioned, it's just super hard to play. Much harder to play compared to EG lineup. And you make a mistake, you make two mistakes. That is tough. And the uh, the impossible or the uh, improbable has happened. EG has Aegis now, so I, I don't know. We're going to watch the team fight one more time and just watch Enigma slowly lumbering forward. And uh, uh, let's see her like, no, no, no. It's the max range black hole. That's, that's when you put the shades on. You know, it's like I got all three all at the corner. Also, little things that help there, like Yule's in the clinks. He did yeah, not yeah, BKB yeah. again. Disarming. Uh, wouldn't have clinks. mattered, to be honest. Like, that black hole was going to go off for the full duration anyway. Yep. But, you know, just every, all the little details were executed quite crisply by EG. And now he has Lincoln Sphere. And also, the other really big thing is, you know, still even now, Secret do not have, as far as I can tell, a gem. I don't know if they've had one at any point. Maybe I think they might have lost one in that fight. Uh, but it seems like the Wolves are giving them the vision. Uh, yeah, Yapsor did lose a gem there. Yep. Uh, but consistently, those wolves have been uphill around corners, giving them vision that's setting up these fights, and that is really one of the hidden attributes that makes Lycan such a strong carry when he's in the meta. Yeah, remember when you know when the game just begun, all of these uh, Spearbreaker uh, rotation have been spot out and countered. We were talking about how EGA was playing very well with rotation. They're going to go right into crit. Crit has a self yules. Black Hole is ready again, though. The combo's available. They got to be careful about this. Puppy wants to back away, but the boat comes crashing in. What will it accomplish? Really nothing. It's a bit of a fail boat as EG just popped their BKBs and rained down pain. Shh. Applause for Zai, patting himself on the back. And EG hot on the chase. Secret, give up. They throw in the towel. Another loss for them and a crucial one here. If they lose this game too, they are guaranteed to be no better than 8-8, eight and eight, and they have to then 2-0 Liquid as well as Fnatic. A very likely lower bracket berth awaits them, I think, at that point, Lumi. So trying to at least scrap a game to win is essential for Team Secret. And they had it this game. They were very close at one point. They had Aegis. They were up on the high ground. And I think high ground Dota is probably the hardest part of Dota. You could uh, get ahead, but whether you could finish or not is... A different story. Close, but no cigar. The boys in blue. Well, they're happy now. Six and three. We'll be back for game two after this.